tuning in it's showtime it surely is showtime hello hello everybody welcome to the brave maker show my name is tony gapastone and today i am live from tahoe i am in the north of california right on the lake i'm going to show you that in a second really really exciting to be able to be here hoping that my wi-fi <laughs> lasts uh for the remainder but check out this view somebody gave this to us for free just so you know check this out Oh my goodness. <laughs> it, it pays to have uh, friends who have their own places like this. I, I do not, but when someone says, do you want to take your family? I say, yes, I do. Thank you very much. So thanks for joining us today. We love talking about the creative arts. Uh, I'm a filmmaker, uh, a writer, director, and I'm going to pass it over to my co-host, Christina Jackson. Hey, Tony. I'm also in uh, Northern California. I'm in Dublin, California, just east of San Francisco. I'm an actor, comic book writer, and singer, and I'm super excited for today's guest and really inspired, really inspired. So uh, because you're inspired by our today's guest, let's start with you first. Every week we ask the question, how have you braved your way to go after your goals this week? We encourage you, if you're watching us live, to also put responses in the comments as well. But what'd you do this week to brave your way to get to those goals for your future? What'd you do? This week, Tony, so I am continuing on my comic book writing journey. And a large part of that is tackling racism. And you really can't talk about racism without talking about colorism, which I don't think we do enough. So I just typed in colorism in YouTube and this fantastic documentary came up and I have been educating myself on what colorism is and what we can do uh, to start kind of, uh, what is the word, unraveling this kind of situation that is really unhelpful and unpleasant and not harmonious for our brown communities. So that's how I've been braving my way. And it's been really eye-opening and really empowering. Right on. Colorism, the documentary, I just put it in the chat. Uh, so if you're watching us live or on the replay, you can go ahead and take a look at that. And for me, my, um, my braving my way this week, I reached out to some animators. So I am trying to turn one of my scripts into an animation. So check this out. I wrote it intending it to be live action, but because I'm having a hard time getting some traction on it, I revisioned it as an animated series. So my hope is to start creating some short animations of this script called called Church Biz that I created and we'll we'll see where that goes. So that's that's the next step for this. When you when one door is not open, you gotta come over this way and make your own door. So that's what I'm doing. Tony, that is so exciting. Of course is that fun? Church Biz and I've seen that and now for it to see it as an animation. What a great that's a great idea. I love it. I Thank love you. It. Thank you. I love that. We'll see where it goes. So with that, let's get to our main guest today. This yeah. Um, guest I met at the American Film Market, which is a yearly conference usually held in Santa Monica for filmmakers and distributors. It was online this time, but I got to meet this great documentarian filmmaker, Maurizio Costa. Yay, welcome, Maurizio. Hi. Maurizio. Maurizio, you're from Brazil, but you happen to be in Texas. Yes, in so, Houston. Give us a give us a little backstory. What's your brave story? How'd you get to be where you are today? Well, that's a good question. But I'm I'm originally from Brazil, from southern Brazil, actually near Argentina and Uruguay. From a poor family, actually not very poor family, from but from from poor family, 
and I made my way through to the university in Brazil, to college, and from there I became a civil servant and then a filmmaker. And that's basically my life, you know? It's a victory through education and, you know, overcoming the social uh, obstacles and difficulties we have, you know? Maurizio, when did you first started feeling passionate about addressing social justice issues? Well, uh, addressing social justice issues as a filmmaker since the beginning, you know, since 2014, 2015, but my uh, my personal uh, relationship with social uh, stories, I think that it comes from my teenage days. I'm from a progressive family in Brazil, political speaking, you know, politically speaking. And uh, that's something that have always made part of my life, actually. So that's something that uh, it's very natural for me. It's all the all, all these stories are actually a part of my story. Even it's not exactly my story, you know. I feel part of social impact stories because uh, I live now in a very different world from what the world I've I was born, mm -hmm. you know, so in, in terms of social class and, you know, understanding of the world, it's completely different. And, uh, but uh, I, I can relate, you know, I don't deny my origins, you know, I, I can relate with social impact stories and uh, espe especially per personal journeys concerning, you know, victory and racial issues. Mm -hmm. That's cool. We talk, you know, a lot in filmmaking, right? That yeah. our our stories, um, our personal takes on films and stories are what makes us interesting, makes our art interesting. And so it seems like that part of what you have created, uh, you know, in your film work is truly based on what you care about and who you are. And with that, I wonder if uh, you want to Give us a little introduction to on the shoulders of giants. I know we have your your trailer. We can we can screen that. But do you want to talk to us about that film? Yes, yes, yes. On the shoulders of giants or uh, Era dos Gigantes in, in Portuguese. Uh, a literal translation would be Age of Giants. Uh, it was my first documentary, and uh, it's a political documentary. It's about foreign policy and uh, relation ship between uh, Brazil and United States, you know, as an emphasis. And this one was my choice for my first movie uh, because, you know, that's a topic that I understand very well because of my profession. You know, I'm a diplomat as a as my day job, as a profession. And uh, I felt safe, actually, you know, and I felt very secure to to talk about foreign policy. So that's why I I I chose this this topic. I had uh, access, you know, to to the people, so it made the process easier, you know. But uh, in terms of, for example, of process and production, I think that this movie and my second movie also that it's about Uber and Uber uh, Uberization, it's mostly uh, the same process, a, a, a digital version of the Brazilian cinema. Brazilian cinema is a movement from the 50s and they had a motto that was you just need a camera in your hand and I, and I and an idea in your mind you Ooh. know and then you go there and do it so the most important uh, Brazilian director of all time that's global uh, global Russia produced a movie like this and today it's possible to do that because of you know the SLR cameras and Zoom recorders is uh, you, you have the you have the the ways if you want it you have the means you know it's possible to do it and you know it's uh, it's big because uh, on the shoulders of giants was released here in the United States it's uh, a Pantaflix it's here on Amazon also you no know? and uh, it's on Pantaflix Pantaflix it's a uh, European actually. Uh, streaming service but it now it's playing more than 20 countries you know so it's fantastic very, yes 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 that's well let's let's watch it i love the i love that comment about an idea in your mind and a camera in your hand yeah. all right so this is the trailer for on the shoulders of giant
A União Europeia é muito forte, os Estados Unidos é muito poderoso, mas o mundo não é só isso. Os Estados Unidos não estão em declínio e o mundo não está numa era pós-Estados Unidos. O presidente Bush esteve no Brasil duas vezes, o presidente Lula esteve nos Estados Unidos durante o mandato Bush duas vezes. As relações entre o presidente Lula e o presidente Bush eram relações de, de respeito. O Bush pediu apoio é, do Brasil à guerra do, do, do Iraque e o, o, o Lula disse, presidente, a minha guerra é outra, a minha guerra é a guerra contra a pobreza. Hillary Clinton foi a Brasília para pedir ao chanceler Celso Amorim e ao presidente Lula para não avançarem. We are pursuing sanctions, which we think is a uh, an important uh, effort by the international community to send a clear message to Iran. So what of that, I know that there are some areas you didn't want to talk about, but what inspired, uh, I think the translation is Age of Giants. Yes. And what did it take to bring that to life? Well, I think that, you know, foreign policy is a, is a topic that people should know more about. You yes. know, because it really, really has a weight in your lives. And, uh, and it's difficult to understand. You know, and uh, uh, the how, you know, how uh, President Bush, Bush or, or President Lula, you know, negotiating in Geneva could really influence your life, you know, mm -hmm. but that happens. And uh, it's important to understand, and especially because in the first decade of this century, uh, Brazil had a very um, unusual, actually, uh, position you know, and uh, a very uh, important leadership in foreign policy. And uh, and especially because in Brazil, for example, and not only in Brazil, you know, but telling about where I came from, the United States is um, always present, you know, in everything. And uh, when you talk about politics and you talk about everything, the United States is a... It's a shadow, you know, over your head. It's a model to follow or a model to fight for or fight against, you know. So it's uh, it, it's it's something uh, powerful to to discuss. And uh, President Lula actually had a very, 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 very polemic or po polemic or polemical, you know, oh, one of the uh, government, you know, in terms of foreign policy. He was very pol polarizing. Like polarizing yes polarizing yes 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 uh, that, yes but, but, but it's it was also polarizing but uh what, what i was trying to 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 express something more about the sen sensationalism you know related to that but yes he was polarizing and and the foreign policy was polarizing too at that time you know I'm I'm curious. So, as a documentarian doing stories on politics, as dicey uh, because you find yourself. I'm sure. Like I don't. I'm not even doing document documentaries on politics, but I have opinions on politics and I have mm -hmm. thoughts, and that is divisive. Just even having those thoughts. So you talk about that that having the idea and then putting a camera in your hand, right? Like people are getting. Uh, you know, losing relationships with families over posts they do on social media about yeah. how they're voting. So can you talk a little bit about the, the challenges of being a storyteller, you know, a documentarian that is doing such polarizing stories? How do yeah. you handle that? Yeah, there are, I think there are two ways, you know, to make a documentary. The first one, if it's your documentary, is a cause. And, uh, you know, people can do that, can do that. I don't have problems with that, but it's not my way, 
you know? So what I did and what I tried to do is balancing the opinions, you know? That's the most important part. So of course I have an opinion, of course I have a position and, uh, and uh, I don't have any hopes that my opinion, you know, just doesn't transpire <laughs> in the movie because it does, you know, but uh, I try to interview and I try to bring people from both sides to talk about it. In this movie was actually difficult because at that time uh, when I shoot when I shoot these interviews, it was 2015. So it was before uh, uh, six months before Lula was accused and then he was, you know, put in jail and that kind of stuff, the uh, scandal on corruption. But in 2015, it was very difficult to find people willing to talk against Lula. You know, that was very difficult at that time. For example, if I try to shoot this movie today, will would be probably more difficult to find people to talk in favor of Lula. You know, in a movie, so it's a it's a very different context, you know. But this movie now uh, has much more value because he's a portrait of a very particular time in Brazil and a very particular time in international relations. So it's actually gaining momentum now, no more than when it, it was released. But my I try to balance. You no, know, it's the same with my second. Um, documentary uh, about Uber and uh, Uberization. You know, at first, as a consumer and as a regular person, I have a totally pro-Uber opinion, you know? Then we start to interview people, we start to talk uh, with Uber drivers, we start to talk with taxi drivers, we start to talk with politicians, and then you, you understand the precariousness, the precariousness, you know, of the work, how Uber influences the processes and the precariousness in the uh, jobs and work relationships, and then your opinion, you know, changes. It's so it's it's different. So I always, 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 I I have as a rule for me, as a principle, always trying to bring both sides. And if you have more than two sides, okay, let's bring two, three, four sides to to the discussion, you know? That's the way. But for example, for uh, On the Shoulders of Giants, that's not, the, the international name is not a translation because I want to, to make a reference to the scientific on, on, on the shoulders of giants, you know? Because of the, like a heritage uh, from the, from the from wiser people you know from from the wisdom of the, from the past and uh, but for example if you have a very right winger in brazil he's going to say that my movie is a leftist movie and a very left leftist person says that my movie is not leftist enough so i'm doing right you know <laughs> if if both extremes are not satisfied it's because i'm in the middle and i'm doing right and so that's uh, that's why what i try to do that's fantastic so you're just presenting facts and keeping your personal judgment and opinion out of the story as you're presenting it i'm curious what attracted you to the uber story to the ride sharing space yes let, let me just say something it's not that i I let my opinion out because, you know, I'm the director, I, I cut the movie, so I have my opinion, but uh, I try to be balanced, you know? I have my opinion, but uh, I, I think that the movie is not about my opinion, you know? It's right. not exactly about persuasion. It's uh, my movie, my movies actually is about, are, are about raising questions more than giving answers. Uh, about Uber, you know, I think that, uh, around 2016, 2017, I I finished uh, Uber versus Taxi in 2017. Uh, Uber was a very uh, new uh, thing in Brazil and you know in South America. Uh, we uh, there was problems everywhere. You know there was a a very um, a very hot you know and hard debate between uh 
taxi drivers and Uber drivers. But during the process and during the movie, we actually had uh, much more a, a debate on Uberization, you know, of the Uberization of the economy, how Uber uh, influenced and how the Uber model actually influenced the economy and the precariousness on jobs, you know, so it's, that's why, you know, and when you talk, you know, with Uber drivers and the guy say, well, yes, I'm here, but I had to drive 16 hours a day. I don't have time off, you know, and then I, I have to pay for my car. I have to pay for my fuel. So your opinion changes, you know, it's very, very different because when you talk, when you think as a consumer, you are completely pro, you know, okay, it's better, it's cheaper, you know, people can work there, there's no problem, but when when you put yourself on the shoes of the driver, it's a completely different situation, you know? So it's, uh, at that time, the uh, Uber in Brazil and South America and all around the world, actually, 2016 and 2017 was a very big deal, you know, in terms of economy, uh, urban mobility, transportation, public transportation, environment, you know, so that's some, that's the kind of um, topic that we discuss. I can show you the trailer if you want. I have... Uh, yeah, please put the trailer in the... Yes, yeah, please I put have it an in international chair. trailer from my from my distributor, you know. I, I'm thinking about uh, our watchers and our listeners, anybody who is interested in making a documentary. We do have a special event coming up in March. It's on March 27th. I'll put the, the link in the chat. But if any of you are interested in uh, creating a documentary or working on it in any phase, this is going to be our first ever documentary forum. And we've got some uh, Emmy nominated and Oscar nominated documentarians who are going to be with us sharing about their experience and how they created their stories, how long it took, uh, how they found funding and distribution. So I encourage you to go to bravemaker.com slash doc forum to be a part of that if you're interested, if you have a documentary. And before we watch um, your next trailer, Maurizio, I'll ask yeah. you when we come back, what are some, what are some tips you have for aspiring the documentary makers how do they know they have a documentary story right because not every story is a documentary story right or one that's um you know that that should be told how do they know all right so i'm gonna i'm gonna pull up the the trailer and we'll watch this and then we'll come back and you can answer re respond to that question here we go this is uber versus taxi Was 18 horas, 14, 15 horas por dia. Aí hoje eu vejo meu vizinho chamando o Uber porque é barato. Mas esse mesmo vizinho, quando passou mal, bateu na minha porta. Oh, vem me socorrer, o taxista que socorre. Quando tem um acidente na rua. Porque a gente não pode ter com a peneira, a gente tem que falar a verdade. E a verdade é essa: é um trabalho de escravo dentro do trabalho do setor de táxi. Nós temos que acabar com isso. Não é escravidão, não, que proprietário não coloca arma na cabeça de ninguém para trabalhar. Trabalha porque quer. Eu sempre falo isso para os caras que falam isso, eu falo, não, ninguém é escravo, não. Profissionalizando ao contrário, né? Na verdade, você está escravizando aquela pessoa. Que, na verdade, esses aplicativos trouxeram foi uma melhoria violenta do serviço de transporte individual de passageiros, né? Que antes era só o táxi que fazia. Por isso que é inaceitável o que eles estão fazendo. E mais, o, o mais grave, é que estão jogando trabalhador contra trabalhador. É, e o Uber veio agregando é, é, uma tecnologia, agregando serviço, é, é, agregando conforto para o usuário e barateando o preço. Trabalhadores explorados. O taxista explorado pelo Estado, o operador do Uber explorado por um aplicativo que veio dos Estados Unidos, né, que ele nem sabe quem é o patrão dele. Eu continuo achando que o sistema por aplicativo. Ele tem uma autorização do Estado para operar aquele trabalho. No Uber não tem. Faz sentido você querer regulamentar esse serviço que estão tendo? Ou faz sentido, na verdade, é, você 
é, aprimorar a regulação para atender é, esse, essa melhoria, melhoria do mercado que veio a acontecer por conta do Estado do Rio. E por isso que é um projeto milionário, bilionário. Well, I didn't understand any of that, but it's beautifully shot, <laughs> Maurizio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you. That, it, it's a, it just need to activate the closed captions on YouTube, but this one that has has subtitles. What if you could change the way your body? Tell us what we were just watching. Uh, okay, no, that's uh, yeah, uh, that's mostly several topics from the movie talking about environment public transportation and uh, some conversations with uh, uber drivers and taxi drivers in brazil but this one you know it's actually it has more value of production than the first one but it's not actually more expensive you know it was just the way you shoot it uh, in this one i tried to do if you watch the whole movie i sh i shot this movie okay to make the audience feel inside the car you know so you are going to uh, to most of the interviews is like you are the passenger and you are talking to the driver and at the same time you know seeing the view from 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 the capital in brazil that's a very beautiful that has a very beautiful architecture you know so it's a that was a huge huge work in editing you know <laughs> but it looked like it that it was good like that, that that was beautiful beautiful well, well how do how do you how do you inspire or how do you think uh, aspiring documentarians know they have a documentary what is it? okay i think that there are several ways that depends on your style and what do you want to do you know uh if you want to follow someone you know follow a character or tell the story of a character i think you need to understand if uh, if the character's journey it's unusual or not, or if it's um, interesting enough, you know. But if you like a topic, for example, uh, for example, I think that you just need to research first. You need to study it first. You need to understand the topic first, and then you can go. You know, you you just have to go. Sometimes make a previous interview, make a pre-interview, talk to potential uh, interviewees and try it. Just try it. No, today, for, for example, no, we are talking here. I'm I'm I used for this first movie, you no, know, my third movie is a completely different uh story, but my for my two first movies that are internationally released and the second one actually was picked by global in brazil is global is you know it's like if you put cbs uh, cbs nbc and abc together in the united states in terms of size there you know and it's uh the the slr movie you know i use mostly uh t um t51 you know from canon t51 and yeah um, it's not about the camera is movies. it right yeah it's, it's, about it's not the about the camera no it's about it's it's about her process but you know now steve soderberg you know you can see in of, of course now steve soberg steve so steve soderberg is you know he he has mary strip as a friend so it's it's easier you know to make an iphone movie with mary strip people people are gonna watch it you know but the guy you have in ajom in in, on HBO Max, movies made with an iPhone 10, iPhone 11, you know, so you have the resources, you know, you just need to use it and you, you just need to be creative. So I think that the first, uh, the first thing to do, if you want to make a documentary, is go there, talk to people, shoot people, and then after that, you can realize how to do it better, or how to use the material you have to make a, a good movie, you know? But first, think about it, research, and go talk to people. That's the, the, the most important part, especially because documentary, uh, documentary filmmaking allows you to use, you know, archival footage, to use news, to use several uh, resources that very different from fiction, you know? Or, and I use fiction because I don't like the term narrative because documentary is also narrative, you know? It's also narrative. It's just not, uh, it's just not uh, 
a fiction, a fictional narrative, no, but it's narrative. And you have the resources, you know, you just go there and do it. Uh, but because today, you know, when you talk with filmmakers, indie filmmakers, younger filmmakers, uh, you have uh, this concern, you know, mostly with, wow, is it 4K? Is it, um, is it, what's the camera you're using? What's the gear, you know? And yes, that's important. But in a documentary, the most, the most important thing is the story. Because, you know, if you are, uh, if you are making a documentary, you, you are going to use, you know, archival footage. You're going to use several uh, kinds of, different kinds of films, you know, different qualities. And uh, it's actually natural. You no, know, so you don't have to be worried. Oh my God, my movie is, uh, is 4K, 10 bits of color. It's ProRes. It's raw. I am I using a red? Uh, what camera do do I use? You know, that's not the important part in the documentary. So go there. Take your phone. Go there and shoot. Talk to people, and try to actually practice your craft. You know, try it, and then you can edit, put the material together watch it and understand your process. You know, uh, uh, I think that documentary actually is very personal in a certain level, but it's also very instinctive the way you do it. You know, because the story depends very much on how you, you as a director and editor, you know, because not, it's not that you don't have an editor for a documentary. You can have an editor for a documentary, but mostly, no, the the narrative is yours. No, it's it's the it's it's the director's narrative. Sorry, I talked oh. I, I talked too much. So. <laughs> I want to go back to what you said about story and narrative, and your third uh, project now, dear brown people. What about that story jumped out to you? Do you have? personal experience or something you could share with us when oh, you yeah. became conscious of colorism? Yes. Well, uh, that's a very sensitive issue, you know, in our world and here in the United States and also in Brazil. Uh, Brazil is very diverse and, uh, and the diversity is actually uh, a problem because you have different perceptions. For example, here in the United States, when you talk about colorism and then you talk about racism, you have a basis, and that basis is the one drop rule. You know? So here in the United States, uh, your, your ancestry defines your race. You know, even though race is a very problematic concept, but you know, it's a social concept today, it's not more a biological concept. Uh, at least not concerning human beings, but uh, it's a social concept, you know? So here in the United States, if you, if you have a black ancestry, you are you can be legally considered black, you know, even within the self-identification system. But in Brazil, it's not. In Brazil, it's the social perception, it's your features, it's your phenotype. And the profession and, and this perception can vary between social classes, regions, cities, even families, even in the same town, you know? So for example, I'm brown, as you can see, you know? I'm a mixed race Brazilian, uh, and I'm I'm mixed between uh, white Portuguese, black Brazilian slaves, and indigenous, you know? So I'm, I'm actually a, a personification of the Brazilian formation, you know, but I'm from a state that is mostly white and it's not white as here in the United States, you think like a white Latino, you know, the uh, in the South of Brazil, the majority of population uh, comes from uh, Italian and German ancestry and Polish and ancestry, you know, and some por and, and some Portuguese that were the first ones. So it's a, it's a region where most people are Caucasian, you know, it's quite different from you expect. And there, as a mixed race person, I'm uh, a minority, 
you know, and uh, in the rest of Brazil, if I go to Bahia, for example, Bahia is a state, uh, Salvador, you know, uh, Bahia's capital, is actually the black, the black, blackest city outside Africa in the world, you know. So there, if I go there, probably people say, no, you are mostly white, you know, but not in my state. My state is Gisele Bündchen. State is not an accusation against Gisele Bündchen. It's just to, to you Americans, visualize the phenotype, you know, the features the, to to understand. So there, uh, racism and colorism is much more similar to the United States, you know the the color the, your skin color comes first when you go to uh, the northeast or or southeast in brazilian the probably the uh, the your nose or your hair type will come first you know to to define the social perception you understand so i'm from a mixed race family i I had, I have actually, and and, and I had uh, the darker skin in my house, you know, in my home, and uh, I suffered, you know, several kinds of situations based on colorism. Because why, you know, because sometimes when people were trying to be uh, to be caring, you know, with me. Uh, they use oh no you are just you are just a darkish no ah you just have to I have an aunt who and you know I love her to today you know but when I think about it when she said to me wow we 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 just need to have a milk bath you know to be to be whiter. You know, or sometimes I have a, a, another aunt, auntie, you know, Auntie Carlinda, who told me, oh, come here, auntie's chocolate. You know, that was scary, you know, but when people try to offend me and, some, and, and sometimes people really close inside my family, the situation was you were a dirty any word. You know, from the white, from, from 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 the white relatives, or not that white in this case. You know, in my family, because mixed, but you know, uh, lighter skin. And or, for example, can you imagine? You know, if you if you live in a family, and the joke of uh, from your cousins is ca is calling you Kunta Kinte. Yes, I was Kunta Kinte in my family. You know, and that and that you think, wow, that's brutal. And and when you see that today, it is brutal. But at at that time, it was just a joke for them. You know, it's a joke. It's a way to make me cry. It was it was a way to make me cry. You know, to 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 make me feel bad. And uh, actually, what made to me is that I actually recognize, I accepted my heritage from black people and that's how i felt my whole life and then i went to university then i you know i actually changed my social class i became a diplomat and then you have the whitewash and then you have the other kind of colorism and then people try to to make you uh, to accept you people try to avoid you know, they avoid to associate to associate you with anything who is black or blacker or darker. So you have the uh, a whitewash, you know, and uh, I don't accept the whitewash over me. And that's something very powerful. And I had uh, several, several discussions and arguments with people from the mix, most mixed race Brazil, you know, saying, no, it's not true. It doesn't happen to you, you know, and uh, so, the, so so you're telling me that my life was a lie, you know, it was not, you know, it's just different. And that's yeah. why the situation with the, the verification boards in Brazil, you know, because the, that's to explain what is the study case in Dear Brown People. You know, Brazil is a mixed race country and it's not difficult to, to define who is black and who is uh, white, you know, in Brazil, that it's sim it's very simple, but it's very difficult to define who is brown and who is the mixed race person who is not almost white, you know? 
and uh, it caused problems in the affirmative action programs in Brazil and the self-identification system. And uh, really, there were people, white people, or at least considered white people in Brazil, who made blackface, you know, to the fraud affirmative actions that happened. But at the same time, you have several brown people and mixed race people, not like me, you know, uh, uh, not only like me, that uh, were accused of being fraudsters, mm. even though they are included by the law. But you know, they are they are considered a fraud, uh, a fraud, a fraudster in Bahia, but they would never be considered a fraudster in my state. So it's a it's it's a very complex and difficult situation, you know. And it's actually uh, some kind of institutionalized colorism. And you think about it, wow, that's a very South African or apartheid, you know, sounds like, but no, you know, it's not a creation from white people in Brazil. It's a, it's a creation and a, and a demand from the black movement in Brazil. Uh, you know, exactly. So, but it's not, it's not, uh, the black movement doesn't have only one voice. So you have people that defend this colorist approach. There are people who defend a more inclusive approach. Everybody's in my movie right now, <laughs> you know. So, uh, especially because we had a, a huge situation in Brazil this month. In Brazil, Big Brother, you know, the reality show, it's huge. Mm. It's huge. Mm -hmm. It's basically one Super Bowl every night. People watching. And uh, two weeks ago, we had in Big in, in uh, on Big Brother a situation between two black Brazilians and a mixed race Brazilians and uh, a dispute, you know, because the black Brazilians was saying that that guy is not a black person, even though he is. So colorism went to the, uh, became a trending topic in Brazil and became a trending topic in the red lines, Twitter, social media, you know, TV, cable network. So now, right now, Brazil is debating colorism thanks to a reality show. Wow. Well, so yeah. it's incredible, right? It is incredible. The, the, actually, I like it. You know, it's very good yeah. for my project. It's good for you. <laughs> so in our, we have a few minutes remaining, Maurizio. Okay. So maybe some short responses here. Okay. Uh, you're, you're still making your, your documentary currently. Yes. Where can people find about, uh, out about you and about the project? Okay. Uh, actually, I'm going to go to Brazil next month uh, to finish the shootings, finally. I'm vaccinated, you know, the only perk of being diabetic <laughs> during the pandemic, I'm vaccinated. So uh, we're going to go to Brazil and we are going to finish uh, the shootings between March uh, 18th and April 18th, 30 days and more than 30 interviews in Brazil to there. Uh, we can find more in our Facebook page, uh, Dear Brown People, and uh, in on uh, our uh, um, IMDb page, also Dear Brown People, and in my social media, uh, Mal Costa on Instagram. Awesome. Gonna, yeah. we'll, we'll share that out with everybody, Maurizio. Thank you so much. Uh, when, I, when I met Maurizio with, at AFM and heard about Dear Brown People and he did his little pitch, I was in one of the rooms where he did the pitch, I thought, oh, this is so great. So if anybody you know, or anybody watching or listening would like to be an investor. I know he's still looking for funding. Uh, as all filmmakers are, we need to help yes. filmmakers tell their story, right? And uh, Brave Maker is all about that. We wanna help people tell their story. And whether it's 20 bucks or 20,000 bucks, everything helps. So find your filmmaker friends and support them. And whether you're an actor or a writer or a director or aspiring, whatever, fill in the blank, we all need to contribute and get these stories out in the world, especially this one. When it comes to equality and justice and diversity, this is a story that needs to be told. Thank you so much for being with us today, Maurizio. But before you go, you very much. we got to end with our Brave Faves. Brave Faves. TV shows, films, books, songs, technology, clothing, podcast, food, and more. These are a few of our favorite people, places, and things. Brave Faves. All right, Christina, what do you got? What's your brave fave for the week? I am so excited to share my brave fave this week. It's available on YouTube and it's called Thrive, the documentary. So if you've ever asked yourself or had a desire to end poverty, racism, we were just talking about colorism and racism, 
and imagine a world globally where we're all thriving, a lot of the answers are in this documentary and it is shocking and fantastic and inspiring and achievable. I, I want to say like, that was the biggest takeaway from watching this. It's like, wow, we could end poverty worldwide. Like the way that we live now with hunger and racism and so much suffering and so much division could be gone within a generation. So I love that kind of wild utopian-esque idea. Uh, definitely check out the documentary and then go over to thrivemovement.com and join the movement. Awesome. Thanks, Christina. What do you got, Maurizio? Yes. Uh, I'm not recommending, uh, I'm, I'm not going to recommend a documentary. I'm going <laughs> to recommend a small and very be beautiful movie called Little Fish. It was released, you know, a few weeks ago, and I, I saw it last week. And it's a very beautiful movie about love, relationship. It's like, you know, a darker version of Eternal Sunshine of a Spotless Mind, maybe. It's a beautiful movie, you know, and, uh, and I really recommend it. Where did you see it? Was it at a festival? No, no, no. This one is uh, is for rental on okay. Xfinity TV. Yes, you can you can awesome. see it the, easily. Yes, I love it with uh, Olivia Cook. That sounds yes, fantastic. yes, yes. Oh, it's a fantastic, good fantastic. Cool. Well, my brave fave is uh, Wandavision. I have been watching this on uh, Disney Plus, and it's so good. My daughters, uh, we all love it. We're like finding all the little Easter eggs. So if you like Marvel stuff and you have not dipped your toes into this wacky little TV show that celebrates all different types of TV and sitcom, it's really fun. And I think you'll like it, especially if you like all the Marvel movies. So that's my brave fave, WandaVision. Thanks everybody for watching today. You all know uh, if you've watched this before that we are a 501c3 nonprofit. We exist on your donations. And my, my um, invitation to you is to consider how you can become a partner. We've got so many amazing things coming up this, uh, this year, 2021. In fact, I'm going to end our, our telecast here with our newest fiscally sponsored project, which is called Glimpse. And I'm really excited to be able to say that these three filmmakers, Kat, Nato, and Alex have joined on the Brave Maker team. And they are going to be telling stories about people, diverse people, and all these different great careers to inspire young people to go after their dreams. Because that's what we're about. We're a 501c3 profit that really wants to elevate brave stories for justice, diversity, and inclusion. And we give away free stuff and free movies. If you go to our website, bravemaker.com slash buzz, sign up for our email. We send it out about two times a month. And there's tons of great stuff coming up. So check that out. Um, before we end, we always end. Good. Thank you to Maurizio, our special guest. Thank you. Uh, we, Thank you very much. We'll, we'll be posting your stuff on our social media, Maurizio, so people can find you. But we always end by uh, wishing people, uh, telling people that brave stories change the world. And you are the story. Bye, everybody. That's right. Bye, everybody. You're going to end with the the video from the Glimpse team. Take a look. Hi everyone, my name is Renato Banyawa Jr. I'm Alexander Gonzalez. I'm Catherine Mendez, and we're working on a pilot for a digital series titled Glimpse. Now, Glimpse will be a 10 minute short form series that takes an individual deep dive into the careers of everyday people from different backgrounds, cultures, and genders. So that way young people can actually see themselves on screen and feel empowered and inspired to really pursue their career goals fearlessly. Our goal is to present these stories to help inspire and motivate the next generation and the generations to follow and to hopefully normalize minorities working in various industries to empower young people in their pursuit of their career goals. And we want to do this by interviewing all different types of people from all corners of the workforce. Of course, in a fun, captivating and informative way. Consider this show's The World According to Jeff Goldblum and Pixar's Inside Pixar to get a feeling and understanding of how our show will flow. We will also be working in partnership with Brave Maker, a local nonprofit here in the Bay Area, and they're really going to help us out throughout the entire process. If you resonate with our goal or feel it necessary to share any of these stories, please consider supporting us by donating to our fundraiser. And get this. There actually are opportunities for tax write-offs since we are working with a local nonprofit. 
Any amount is welcomed and greatly appreciated. You can also support our show by sharing this on your social media or sending it to people you may know, like friends and family. You can also follow our Instagram at glimpse underscore show to keep up with the updates as we create the pilot. Once again, we greatly appreciate any and all support. So thank you for taking a glimpse at glimpse. You see what I did there? Isn't that funny? It's like a glimpse into glimpse. Okay, goodbye. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook at BraveMaker.org. Like, subscribe, and share. To become a monthly donor, text the word BraveMaker to 44321 or go to BraveMaker.com slash donate. Thanks for tuning in.